everyone. Now I'm on the microphone. The, um, uh, we are here to celebrate the 178th birthday of, of uh, Mrs. Uh, Olivia Langdon Clemens, who is in fact here present today in order to ac accept our wishes. And I'd like to invite her to the stage at first. How do you do? It's so nice to see you and happy birthday. Thank you. Yes. So lovely to be here. And of course, we also have her, uh, uh, a woman who has studied her for many, many years. Uh, you'll be happy to hear your uh, object of study. I know you don't like having your letters read, but I'm afraid uh, we, they, have they are, have been read, and now they are being published. So I'm published. They're being published so that everyone can read them. Oh goodness. Well, perhaps. Yes, that's in there. <laughs> <laughs> one of my, my one of my phrases that I go to very often, but um, at least maybe these are not my husband's letters. Uh, no, no, no. Those have all already been published, actually. Oh, so oh. we'll uh, leave that subject and uh, and start with that program. But thank you so much You're for very being welcome here. And thank you, everyone. And it's so nice to have all of you here, all around the world, helping to celebrate my birthday. Thank you, <laughs> and thank you, Miss Snow. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Happy birthday again. Yes, so um, here we are. Uh, let me get out my spiel. I'm Steve Courtney, by the way. Uh, I'm a, a hanger on here at the Mark Twain House. And uh, I want to start saying just how many of you have heard of the Center for Mark Twain Studies in Elmira, New York. I see a lot of hands in the auditorium here, uh, and presumably there are a lot of virtual hands at home. Driving into Elmira, you might think, gosh, another small upstate New York City, a little down at the heels, but set in a lovely valley along a sparkling river with the Native American name Chemung. But in that valley, in that city, is not only a vibrant small college, Elmira College, but also one of four or so sites in the nation associated with the witty, sparklingly descriptive, and voluminous writings of a vastly talented author. Elmira College has wisely devoted a decent chunk of its resources to the Twain Center. It preserves an important archive. It provides an essential international conference every four years for those interested in Twain and his life and work. It supports worthy efforts elsewhere, including this very lecture series in faraway Hartford. It offers events and symposiums and fellowships all through the year. And for us here at the Mark Twain House, and for me personally in my work on the life and associations of Mr. Samuel Langhorne Clemens, for many of those years, 2004 to 2015, Barbara Snedekor, our speaker tonight, was the face of the Center for Mark Twain Studies. While she led this institution so ably, broadening its mission and dealing with thousands of administrative details, she had an idea in mind. Tonight, we celebrate the culmination of that idea. Barb's idea. Early on, she decided that the voice of Livy Clemens, or rather she would prefer to call her Olivia Clemens, Mark Twain's spouse, had been muted not because biographical information was lacking or that Livy's writings in hundreds of letters were not available, but because they were available only to the scholars who sought them out in the labyrinths of archival collections. Now the heart of these letters are collected in this book, Gravity, I'll hold it up, which I think of as providing a paradigm shift in the way we view her husband's essential life and work, and of course her own life and work. Let me quickly thank our sponsors, I, as I mentioned, the Center for Mark Twain Studies, and also Connecticut Humanities, a nonprofit affiliate of the National Endowment for Humanities, which supports cultural and historical organizations that tell the state stories build community and enrich lives. I feel like somebody on public broadcasting with that long, but I think required uh, description. There will be time for questions toward the end, and as a reminder, a replay of tonight's event 
will be made available on the Trouble Begins playlist of our YouTube channel, accessible through our website, that is the Mark Twain House, uh, marktwainhouse.org. But now about, about Barb, as mentioned, she was director of the Center for Mark Twain Studies from 2004 to 2015, when she re received the prestigious Henry Nash, Nash Smith Award in 2017, her accomplishments were noted. The Mark Twain Literacy Program, which helped place hundreds of Mark Twain books in the classroom of local teachers at no cost. The creation of a digital archives of the center's own Trouble Begins lecture series. The creation of a Mark Twain Summer Teachers Institute, which educated educates regional teachers, reinforcing Twain's legacy for local students, uh, the, the facilitation and solidification of the Quadrennial Conference, and the facilitation of a number of Mark Twain symposia. Sorry. Oh, and not to mention installing a permanent exhibit of Clemens and Langdon-related artifacts in a college building. And somewhere along the way of all this, she produced uh, scholarly papers and a revision of an important work on Mark Twain in Elmira, really a second home during the time he lived in Hartford, 1871 to 1891, because of Olivia Clemens' background there. The award giver said, the most important legacy of Barbara Snedekor is the goodwill she has fostered in the Twain academic community and local Elmira community. And so she always has with the greater community, including us. So Barb, on to our conversation. First, tell us a little bit about Olivia Clemens's connections to Elmira and why it became an important place for, for the family when they stayed there. I mean, obviously, uh, Olivia was born in Elmira. Um, she you mean just her, her general background? Just in general, because not everybody may know it. Yeah, her mother and father uh, started out in a town nearby in Millport. Um, after time and season, her father decided to move down to Elmira. Uh, he became pretty important in the lumber and railroading industry in Elmira. Uh, very quickly developed new wealth um, and then Olivia was so Olivia was born at the time when his uh, wealth was sort of emerging and increasing. Uh, her parents were truly wonderful people by all description. Generous, smart, uh, talented, uh, invested in this community of Elmira that they that they moved to from Millport. Uh, they helped found the Park Church, uh, which was. Uh, Again, a generous, free-thinking church um, took an anti-slavery stand at that time, which was uh, a bold move to take by a congregation. Uh, her father helped found Elmira Female College. Uh, both parents believed in excellent education for their three children. Uh, their oldest daughter was adopted into the family. Um, she was just a wonderful human being. Uh, Olivia was the middle child when she was born. Her older sister was nine, and then younger brother Charles followed a few few years later. I mean, that's sort of a basic summary of, uh, it, it almost sounds like a fairy tale, I guess, but these were really fundamentally good, good people. Um, and I think she benefited hugely by the, you know, the opportunity to be born into such a good family. And then, of course, that led to their almost almost yearly uh, stays in Elmira during the summertime, correct? Samuel yes. and Olivia. Yeah. yeah, once they married, of course. Um, Which was also in Elmira. Right. <laughs> they married in the Langdon Mansion in Elmira with this new wealth. As I said, they helped found the church, found the college, built a beautiful, or redid a beautiful home in the center of Elmira. And Samuel Clemens came courting Olivia beautiful home eventually won her over and they were married there in the house in the city of Elmira and as years went by uh, it became the habit to come to Elmira for sort of a summer vacation uh, 
to leave the hustle and bustle here in, Elmar, uh, in Hartford and escape to a hilltop setting. Uh, so the family's mansion was down in the city of Elmira and maybe a couple of miles up a hill was a beautiful home owned by Olivia's older sister, Susan Crane, and her husband, Theodore. And that's where Samuel and Olivia began to summer. So you uh, were head of an institution devoted to, of course, like this one, Mark Twain. Mm -hmm. So what, what sparked your interest in Olivia at, at the very first? But that is a question that maybe has a, a three-part answer. Um, so I became, or was invited, I guess, to become director of the Center for Mark Twain Studies at Elmira College in 2004. Sort of, it was an amazing gift, unexpected, right, to be invited to, to direct the center. Uh, and I was sort of a newbie to Mark Twain Studies. And a lot of people who are English majors uh, in that pipeline and education encounter Mark Twain. And I had encountered Mark Twain, but uh, I didn't have a deep dive into his work. And all of a sudden, I found myself in this new position as director of this center for Mark Twain Studies. And the first task that came my way was to work with a local sculptor, Gary Weissman, who lived in Newfield outside Ithaca, New York, close to Cornell. It turned out that the then entering class of 2008 so this was 2004, they were gonna graduate in 2008. They had decided that when they graduated, their class gift to the college would be a statue of Olivia Langdon Clemens, who had attended Elmira College, was a member of the class of 1864, though she didn't graduate, but that's okay. So here I was, a brand new director. I was ushered into the president's office of Elmira College and he gave me this assignment. He told me I had to work with Gary Weissman to produce this sculpture in four years' time. I knew nothing about Olivia Langton Clemens, you know, other than the basic fact that she was married to Mark Twain. And it turned out that the sculptor was a wonderful, wonderful guy. Uh, his trademark was to become familiar with sort of the inner workings of whatever sculptor he was going to work on. And so he wanted me to gather all the photographs I could of Olivia Langdon and all the information I possibly could on her. And there wasn't very much. <laughs> I mean, there were, there were photographs. There was uh, two really wonderful works by uh, two Mark Twain scholars, Susan Harris, Laura Scandera Trombley. There was a biography by Risa Willis. Uh, there were lots of scholarly comments about her. There were letters quotes about her by friends, but even so, that wasn't very much. I, I felt like I didn't really know her. Uh, everything that was written about her was pretty good. There were some things about her that were, written, that were pretty bad. <laughs> so Gary and I, you know, we just tried to piece together who this woman was. And there was one moment that I will never forget. I was actually thinking about it as we were, as I was driving down here this morning. Uh, we asked a director of the Shemung History Museum in Elmira to uh, set up a dress of Olivia for us on a mannequin in the museum. So one afternoon, Gary and I met Lori Wilson and she escorted us into a room. Uh, and there in the distance was a, a dress on a mannequin. But for me, in that moment, I, I truly felt like I was looking at Olivia Langdon. Beautiful lavender dress, uh, long dress, long sleeves. And because he was a sculptor, you know, he needed to measure every aspect of that dress to get a good understanding of her form, right? So there I was with the yellow dressmaker's measuring tape, you know, that probably you all may have seen measuring her waist, measuring her arms, measuring the length of her fingers, looking at her shoes, measuring them. Uh, you know, it was just sort of another otherworldly kind of experience to, to do that physically, to, to measure 
a person. And, you know, gradually over time, four years passed and a, a truly beautiful sculptor, sculpture appeared on the Elmira College campus, which of course still stands there today. So that had a deep impact on me, you know, that was part one. Part two was, um, I think around in 2007, I was feeling myself sort of not uh, real, real smart about 19th century American literature. I, I had a master's degree at that point, but uh, I just was feeling like I, I needed more now that I was in this job working with so many, to me, very brilliant scholars who knew so much about Mark Twain's writings and life. So I decided to go back to school to get a doctoral degree with the blessings of Elmira College. And the first two years passed, I did all my coursework, and then came the time when you have to pick a dissertation topic. And I was dabbling around in certain ideas, but hadn't really settled on anything, and uh, went to a conference out in San Francisco where a wonderful woman named Carrie Driscoll, who many of you in Hartford know very, very well, was also in attendance. And I'm just going to switch out to the microphone. No problem. <laughs> we sat down outside a hotel in between sessions in the beautiful California sun, and she had just recently finished a paper, I think, on Mark Twain's music box, and. She said to me words to this effect, you know, maybe you ought to take a look at the letters of Olivia Langdon Clemens. She had had a taste of them and uh, she liked them. And that moment, you know, truly changed my life. And Carrie sits here tonight and I warmly offer you my deep thanks for that moment, which changed my life. Um, so. The next moment is also sort of miraculous because it, it turned out that just at the moment I decided to try and take on this project at the Mark Twain Papers at the University of California, Berkeley, they were just finishing up a transcription of Olivia's letters, which was an absolutely miraculous gift because initially I started trying to read her letters under a microfiche dome, you know, and that was not so good. I probably still would not have finished my dissertation <laughs> today if I was still under the microfiche dome trying to read all these letters. But having that transcription sent to me um, in my office at Elmira College was just another one of those moments that seemed sort of unearthly, you know. So working on that dress, on that sculpture, having that conversation with Carrie. And then in 2017 at a Mark Twain conference in Elmira, uh, an editor at the University of Missouri Press at that time, Gary Cass, came up to me and asked me, would you, would you want to try and work on an edition of Olivia's Selected Letters? And I mean, that's another dream <laughs> question another dream moment to have someone ask you that. And um, the, the way I had put the dissertation together wasn't really all that good. I mean, it, it was okay, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't what it ought to have been, I think. So uh, his invitation to, to really present the letters was uh, a, a huge challenge for my mind, you know, to try and wrap around my brain how to how to work on this project. So I began to look at a lot of letter collections and um, took a deep dive in and and here we sit. <laughs> Many years later. <laughs> Sorry for such a long answer. No, that was wonderful. <laughs> I, I didn't know most of that. Good. <laughs> and um, uh, why? OK, the title is Gravity. Yeah, what about that? Why Gravity? <laughs> Well, early on in this adventure, learning about Mark Twain and his life, uh, you know, you you early on learn that Olivia affectionately called him youth. Probably you're all very much aware of that. And he called Olivia gravity. Not a tremendous amount of times, you know, but enough in the early courtship letters that it really strikes strikes a chord with anybody who's reading them, you know. At first it seems that it's just a commentary on 
her sense of humor, which he saw as being somewhat grave, you know, <laughs> not as spontaneous uh, as his probably. Uh, so he uses it a couple of times with lowercase, and then uh, there's a moment after they're unofficially engaged, or well, anyway, she has his engagement ring, and she refers to it in her letter to him as the largest piece of furniture in the house. And he, he says, that's, that's a sense of humor worthy of you, my affianced gravity, capital G. Uh, so for me, I mean, yes, there was this aspect probably about her that she was not the wild humorist of the East Coast. <laughs> you know, he was the wild humorist of the Pacific Coast. Uh, so there was that element. But to me, as I got to know this woman who was sort of unknown to me on the mannequin, you know, as so I got to know who she was, it became sort of clear to me at least that gravity to me was beginning to mean that there was this really wonderful attractive force between Samuel Clemens and Olivia Langdon, you know, uh, as strong as gravity. And and on a deeper level, I felt that she was sort of the force that grounded him, kept him steady, you know. He was a, a brilliant man, right? A creative man, uh, a passionate man across all emotions, you know. And uh, I think she, she held him steady, thus gravity. <laughs> Now, uh, here on our tours, mm -hmm. and in many other places, probably 90% of scholarly writings, mm -hmm. or biographical writings, she's Livy. Yeah, I knew we were going here. <laughs> <laughs> to you, throughout the book, she's Olivia. Right. In your introduction and every, every right. reference to her. There's a couple of responses to that. Um, one is maybe just a purely personal one that it's hard for me to call her Livy. Something wrong with me, I guess. You know, it seems way too familiar. I can't call Samuel Clemens Sam either. It seems, I don't know, just disrespectful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that's me. So it doesn't have to be you. <laughs> But on another level, as I began to know her through her letters, I was so intrigued by the fact that she often signed her letters, Olivia L. Clemens. Not just in the beginning, but over the arc of all her letters, almost to the point that she's approaching death with the heart failure in those years. So many times it's Olivia L. Clemens. Even to Samuel, to her mother, and to some of her very dearest friends. It's also Livy, it's Livy L.C., it's Livy L. Clemens. I mean, she, she, she signs her name in many ways, but you know, the fact that she was still writing Olivia L. Clemens late in her life seemed to suggest to me that her name and how she signed it meant something to her, you know? Um, and I just, felt like I wanted to respect that, you know. Who was I to call her Livy? And because some of her very dearest friends who she writes to, particularly in those very difficult years after Susie has died, she signs them Olivia L. Clemens, you know. So for me, there's something kind of poignant about that, um, that I wanted to respect. As Miss Olivia sits in the back there. <laughs> and so did learned that she was in I mean did, did you do you have an impression of her as having really been a gravity to Mark Twain and and but more broadly what um, you've you've followed Olivia through what 1867 mm -hmm. or so mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. the first 64 letter, I think, 64 was, yeah, I think. and right through to 1904 right. uh, months before her death right. uh, and um, so you know her pretty well, and what what can you tell us about that, about how, who is the woman that you've gotten to know? Yeah, there's no easy, uh, simple, quick answer to that. You know, like most of us, she emerges as a pretty multi-dimensional, 
person, right? If you want to hone it down to her relationship with Samuel. I was often kind of stunned at how much she loved him. I mean, maybe that's a silly thing to say. You would expect that, but she expresses it, you know. Sometimes she expresses it in intimate ways, I feel, for that century, in physical ways, uh, physical descriptions, in beautiful closes to her letters to him. Uh, you know, I, I, I just felt like maybe that wasn't an ordinary love that they had. Maybe, maybe it really was uh, a source of grounding for him to know that she was there for him. Um, you know, she, her, the early years of their marriage, you, you just feel her joy and her intensity in those early months and years. And then quite soon they lose a child, right? And so uh, she starts maturing quickly. You know, first her father dies, her son dies, a friend dies. Uh, then they're traveling across the ocean and there's always that risk of of death in traveling, you know, much much more than I think probably we're aware of today. She seemed to be keenly aware of that. And then the, the girls are born, uh, and then her husband's writing career takes off, and you know she's she's just there as this voice of constancy, uh, managing her life and their lives. Uh, certainly, as you as you get towards the end of her life and. She's lost her daughter, Susie. You know, that, that grief was unspeakable. You know, her letters sort of abruptly uh, reduce in numbers at that point. Uh, so for me, I just felt like over the, the course of her life, you see a young woman mature and deepen and, and become a fabulous, mature, older woman. A lot of people wonder, uh, I think she, she was popularly known as uh, helping him edit his works, would read his manuscript pages at night, supposedly, right? We, we read this from Katie, Katie O'Leary's account and some other accounts. And I, I guess I was thinking that the letters were going to show this, you know, uh, intense comments by her about this book, you know, or this paragraph, or... Uh, clean this up or whatever, you know. But, I mean, maybe there's one or two letters where you kind of see her chiding him or, or make, actually more often she's making a suggestion about what he might use in a lecture, you know, to, to, to deliver before an audience. So that was sort of a surprise to me because I was expecting to, to meet this literary editor, you know. But she doesn't emerge in that way, at least for me. She just emerges as a wonderful wife <laughs> and supportive supportive spouse and, and uh, wonderful mother to her children. But, but also uh, uh, opinionated and strongly opinionated. Mm -hmm. And um, we did talk before about possibly your reading a short excerpt from right. two, two letters. Right both of which were just when they came back right. from Europe in 1879. If you would like to do that. Surely. This way we get a, a little of I guess voice. I have to say, you know, in, in a little interview like this, it's pretty impossible <laughs> to accurately cover all dimensions of this woman's personality. So uh, bear with me. Well, you're doing it very well. <laughs> so this one is 1879. She's writing to her mother. And you do uh, experience shifts in her voice uh, as she writes her mother, as she writes her sister, as she, might, as she writes Samuel, of course. Y you start to become familiar with uh, just how she adjusts to who she's writing to. So this is to her mom. Uh, we are all well. The children have slight colds in their heads, but they are not at all sick with them. They are so happy to be at home and think everything is so nice. The other night, Susie gave me quite a reproof. I said to Mr. Clemens, I am low. He turned to Susie and said, Susie, why do you let your mama get low? She said, Mama, I don't see how you can be low now. You have come back to your beautiful home. Just a nice uh, selection of dialogue in the family there. And this is 
just after they've returned to Hartford after being in, in Europe for quite a while. I should have. And Susie is how old? Fifth. Oh, we're at eight, 1879, so she's seven. Yeah. I don't see how you can be low now that you have come back to your beautiful home. So here's the, here's the follow-up comment to that. I am getting on very well indeed, but mother, I don't believe you know what it is to set a house going that has stood empty for 18 months. This is the house over here. <laughs> the pots and kettles are all rusty. The laundry chimney would not draw in fast. All the chimneys smoked. Clothes, after they were washed, had to be taken over to Patrick's to be ironed. We could not remember where the servants' bedding was packed away. No dish towels, no tablecloths or china or silver unpacked. Everything, everywhere, in confusion. I have felt a good many times during these days that if it were not for the children, I would give up housekeeping. But when I remember the sense of being taken care of, which I had both with you and at the farm this summer, I feel that I must give the same sense to the children. What an intense love of home I always had as a young lady. Now surely I ought to be able to do for my children what you did for me. Next one. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> this is uh, right, written in Hartford. Same year. It's actually not that much after the excerpt we just read. And again to her mother. Mother darling, she starts that one off. I told Mr. Clemens the other day that in this day, women must be everything. They must keep up with all the current literature. They must know all about art. They must help in one or two benevolent societies. They must be perfect mothers. They must be perfect housekeepers and graceful, gracious hostesses. They must know how to give perfect dinners. They must go and visit all the people in the town where they live. They must always be ready to receive their acquaintances. They must dress themselves and their children becomingly. And above all, they must make their houses charming. And so on without end. Then, if they are not studying something, their case is a hopeless one. I do love you all at home, mother dear, and I often wish that we lived near you. How I wish you were sitting in your corner. The conservancy doors are closed, so there would be no chill from there on your back. What lots of things we would talk over. So it, is, it is nice to read you a, a few excerpts. <laughs> so, Thanks, Steve. Yeah. So she obviously was very close to her mother, who, mm -hmm. and she only really outlived her mother by about, what, 14 years or so. Yeah, really, not that yeah. long. Mm -hmm. And so, and what did you, what can you say about that relationship? Although it's pretty clear, I guess, from those yeah. excerpts. Her mother was amazingly generous. <laughs> You read it, you can just kind of chuckle sometimes about the ch checks that are coming her way, you know. There's one she says, I, I saw, when I saw the five, I thought it was 500, or I, I might be misquoting this, but anyway, it turns out to be 5,000 or, so, or 10,000, you know, something like that. I saw 10 and I thought it was 1,000, whatever. Um, her mother was m amazingly generous with them and, and with all, all three children, really. So there's that aspect of the relationship, the mother-daughter relationship, but there's also just really, you know, tender communication that goes back to her mother. She's pretty, pretty dutiful and faithful in writing her when they travel. I mean, realize they they live overseas for so so many years, so it's absolutely necess a necessity that she writes home, right? <laughs> Keeps in touch with her mother, and she she tends to write, you know, once a week which is remarkable, right? Twice a week, maybe, when things are uh, slowing down. Uh, so clearly she had a nice relationship with her mom and with her sister, Susan Crane, uh, also a beautiful sister relationship with her. Um, I mean, she, she was in incredibly blessed to be part of a wonderful family, you know, and then that naturally, I think, was duplicated in the life she made with Samuel and with their children. <clears throat> and are there letters to um, to the daughters mm -hmm. later on when they're in Europe and Clara's studying elsewhere and that kind right, of thing? Right, right. What, um, 
I mean, there what you, would you say about that. Uh, uh, the early letters, when the girls are young and little children, there's just some really beautiful anecdotes, you know, quotes about what Susie's doing or Bay, Clara's doing or Jean. Um, Bay sucked her thumb a lot, and uh, she, she, she told me. I, God told me to do it. That's why I suck my thumb, you know. And uh, there's a, a nice little booklet, I guess we could call it, "Small Foolishnesses of Susie and and Bay Clemens," which Olivia and Samuel kind of composed together, and they kept an account of all the many cute sayings that the daughters said. It was a beautiful thing to to look through, and Olivia, in her letters does that too you know she'll she'll just tell you these sweet things that these little girls are saying and doing as they're growing up and then of course they become young women and things get more complicated right because they're dealing with emotional young women uh, who are wanting to date and uh, you know Olivia's trying to manage that as is Samuel you know and so uh, the dynamics change considerably uh, and you you sense that in the letters in a wonderful way uh, there's a, a moment when Clara is uh, at a, a ball in, in Europe. I'm, I can't remember which country they're in at the time, but she ends up uh, at the Von Versen ball, and she's in a room alone eating with 40 offices, officers, young men, you know. And this is quite upsetting to Samuel and Olivia, that their daughter is alone in this room with all these soldiers <laughs> eating in that time period, maybe. A risky behavior. <laughs> yeah, and he—I mean, his daughters, or his daughter, surviving daughter Clara, who mm -hmm. who wrote about him and lived right. in later years. Uh, uh, she would point out the fact that he could get quite furious, really mm -hmm. furious. I mean, harmfully furious, and uh, not physically harmful, but just uh, upset, like about the officers' yeah. incident. And uh, does does that come across at all? In the, letters I don't feel Olivia I, 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 I guess I don't think I feel an angry I don't think I ever encountered an angry Olivia now, there's one moment maybe where she's sort of angry at Samuel for for something he's written and, and, and so maybe there's that but with her daughters it's an, it's not anger it's just kind of maternal concern and uh, trying to manage them you know yeah, I, I mean, I find that um, reading them, uh, I mean, I know, uh, happen to know a lot about Mark Twain's biography mm -hmm. and what he went through in his life. And Oh, you pointed out that um, uh, <clears throat> we hear a lot about his grieving over his Susie's death. The, she died at 24, mm -hmm. uh, terribly here in the house of uh, spinal meningitis. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's there are there's quotes a famous quote about that he made about he couldn't understand why how anyone could suffer a blow like this and live. It's one of the mysteries of our nature. Meaning himself, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. And um, uh, and and one great thing about these letters is that you get the other side of the story, right. which you described very well. I mean, the the, the grief that comes from a mother. Yeah as opposed to a father who was quite in, a in both person. of the two major losses that they experience right the son at 18 months and then Susie at 24 years we're all pretty familiar with Samuel Clemens's reaction to those two deaths and in my assignment at Elmira College you know I was I was into the biography of Samuel Clemens and I was often giving presentations and talks about him. So I really got to know a lot of his things that he said by heart, you know. And I, I used to feel like, hey, you know, there was a mother here. <laughs> there was a mother here who lost a child, too. And where is that voice? And so the, the from I, I don't know if this is true, but in the moment right now, it feels true that, you know, maybe the biggest gift for me in, in working with the letters was to, to learn about Olivia's feelings of grief and loss, particularly with Susie, you know. Uh, as a uh, few letters as she's, they're nearing the end of their around the world tour, they're heading back to England and she's waiting to have a letter come from 
Susie and it doesn't come, you know, and no letter from Susie in one letter and then still no letter from Susie, you know, underlined. And of course, we know what's going on. <laughs> we know she's dying home in Hartford, you know, but that's just so poignant to me. And then after she does pass away, it's so hard for Olivia to write, you know. There's silence for a while, in fact. And then she starts to reach out to her beloved female friends. And the voice of her grief is really, really beautiful to me, you know. I mean, maybe it's not as flowery as her husband, but he, he was a master craftsman of language, right? He changed the shape of American literature. But this was the woman who he trusted his heart with, you know, and she's pretty darn good with expressing her emotion, too. And it's nice to get that out here. <laughs> Would you like to, could you bear to read the letter to, to Mary Fairbanks? I can try. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, t what, three months, December 1896. Right. Three months after... Um, so Mary death. Fairbanks figured prominently in the early part of their courtship, right? And here she is much later in life now after Susie has died. So this is 28 December 1896. Dear Mother Fairbanks, we are going on as well as we can. We even talk to each other and smile, and perhaps a stranger coming in would not see that we are a broken-hearted family, yet such we are and such I think we must always remain. This is, of course, the first terrible, staggering b blow that we have had, and I realize that for me, there can be but one worse. She doesn't identify what that one worse might be. So you can all ponder what she refers to there. Mr. Clemens is going on with his work but he has found it very uphill work. Now, however, I think he is getting a little bit more interested in it. I wish I were where I could sit by you and have a little talk with you. I write this in place of Mr. Clemens because I try to take all letters off his mind. He goes to his study directly after breakfast and works until seven o'clock in the evening. Believe me. And to Grace King, another friend, this is just the next letter. I'll just read a line or two. Constantly I have wanted to write you, but I have not been able. I am too broken-hearted and unreconciled, and life seems to me too bitter and too little worthwhile. I have longed to hear from you again, but I could not write. Every detail of Susie's leaving us seems so unbearable. We left her. She was not a child that we should ever have left. We were almost ready to lay our hands on her once more and she slipped away from us. I feel that she was badly managed and that it need not have been. She was my joy and pride. Life is so dull, the poetry seems gone out of it. I have always had much courage even when things seemed hard, but now I have none. That's really some profound expressions of deep grief. And that's just a, a sample. Just flipping through these pages in this section of the book at almost every page, really, really moving passages. Now, not everybody who gets, who becomes interested in someone edits a collection of letters from them. Right. Uh, and this took you how long in total? About Too long. <laughs> <laughs> I have my apologies to the virtual Mark Twain community that it took me so long to get this project oh, no. done. <laughs> but it's done so beautifully and so right. So, but, but what, um, what was sort of the, what were the main challenges other than finding time to do it, which I'm sure was yeah. difficult. There were so many challenges for me. Um, ironically, at the very end of this project, the corner of our bedroom where I work, my husband put up with this messy stack of books for years and years and years. Finally, when it was all done, I was cleaning things up, and I came across an, um, 
I don't even know if it was which press I had sent my dissertation to, and they had rejected it, you know. And one of the readers who had rejected it said, uh, one option Ms. Snedeker might consider would be to uh, put together a, a collection of select letters. And if she did so, she might think about working with another person to, to manage the workload. <laughs> Well, sadly, I only read that letter after it was done because I thought, why? I don't know. I didn't. Why did I not pay attention to that? <laughs> why did I just do this by myself? I was crazy. <laughs> but that's just a funny story. The the hardest part of the whole job was selecting the letters, and that might have been easier if I had worked with another person too. <laughs> This is not all of her letters, I have to confess. This is Yeah, 675 were in the letter collection, well when, I, collection. when I printed out the letters in my office at Elmira College. The stack was about 18 inches high of paper. Hmm. So, and, and here we've got a book, you know, <laughs> which has about 275 letters in it, and they, some of them have been sort of um, sliced into a little bit, too, you know. That's a very terribly weighty thing to try and select what makes the cut. And when I first finally was able to submit the first really significantly somewhat polished draft to my editor at the University of Missouri Press, Mary Conley, she so graciously and kindly helped me hewn it down. You know, her, her new eyes, her new ears could remove some stuff, you know, that she, she she could see maybe wasn't as relevant as other pieces, and I was so grateful for that. But then more still needed to come out, and that was really hard. So I'm sorry you don't have a book full of 675 letters, but you probably wouldn't be able to afford it, so even now it's pretty costly. <laughs> so the... the um, uh, uh, the um you, you have the, oh, the creation of the footnotes. You did a, that, and there's a mass of, of scholarship, the sort of the, under the tip of the iceberg here. It's not just letters, but a, a right. tremendous amount of biographical detail and. Yeah, uh, that was, uh, I mean, to the virtual Mark Twain community, I owe my thanks to you all for the marvelous books you put together at the Mark Twain papers work by David Fears was helpful at many at many instances to point me in the right directions. Biographies written by wonderful biographers. Uh, you know, they were all stacked around my desk all the time. Um, and I, I, when I began working at Elmira College, I really fell in love with Mark Twain's letters and with that six volume set. I remember when Bob Hurst sent me that set in the mail and I just began to pour through it. And I thought, this is the most amazing letter collection I have ever seen in my life and ever will see in my life. And what I have here is just a, a, a tiny bit of what those marvelous editors do. But I also feel like uh, the University of Missouri Press was so kind in allowing the notes to immediately follow each letter and uh, Gary Cass made the wonderful suggestion about how the uh, notes should appear. And I think that it's a, it's a nice read. Uh, you don't have to read the notes. You can skip right over them, and it, that's fine with me. <laughs> but if you want to look at them, I think it's going to feel easy to access them and remember where they came from in the letter. and. Because the letters are studded with names and incidents oh, that you could, would not survive without knowing something about these. You know, you know, Mark Twain was a rock star. He was, I think he lived the largest life in his century, and she lived it with him, <laughs> <laughs> which was hard for me. There was some, t sometimes it took me a long time to get through one letter, <laughs> trying to chase down all all of the notes. Mm -hmm. But she lived it with them. And, uh, exactly. I will, uh, maybe we will 
halt there and open this up to the audience, both uh, present and virtual. Um, when those of you who are present ask your questions, I will repeat them so that the people in the virtual world can hear them as well. Um, so, are there questions? Yes. Yeah, the question is, uh, uh, the questioner is curious about the community involvement of Olivia Clemens mm -hmm. um, here in Hartford and even further afield. Um, have I got that right, pretty much? She does talk about her work in a, a benevolent society. Uh, forgive me, it's the full name of the society is not coming to my mind right now. But clearly, that was very meaningful for her. For her. Um, Overseas, uh, I mean, there you see her interacting with a lot of people, uh, acquainted with a lot of important people through her husband. But I'm not so sure I see her in any way, in any big way, impacting like community efforts overseas. But you certainly do see it in Hartford. Yes. And I have to apologize to the virtual audience that now I have the crackly microphone, so I apologize <laughs> if it crackles. Um, but we do have a few from the virtual audience. Um, so the first one is, I read the book, I loved it. Um, in your intro, you say the book included 275 out of 600 plus surviving le letters. Is there any chance of a volume two? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> We, actually, I was at lunch today with Carrie and Steve, and we kind of brought that up. I don't know. I don't know how it would be organized. That's what that was my response because this is chronological, you know. So uh, any other collection would sort of overlap chronologically, you know. Uh, so I don't know. I can tell you there were um, a lot more letters that she wrote to Alice Hooker Day here in Hartford, you know. Uh, her very dear friend over the course of her entire life. And those were hard for me to cut, you know, but I mean, maybe to a degree, this is what adolescence is kind of like, you know, and, and maybe you don't need to know about the hair pieces, you know, that they were having trouble getting back from a hairdresser. I, I don't know, you know. <laughs> well, maybe that's in volume two, <laughs> some of those details. All right. The next one is, why does Olivia refer to Sam as Mr. Clemens when writing to her mother? Well, so here's part of the, my problem with not calling Olivia Livy either, you know, because there was a, uh, maybe some formality of manners in that century, you know. Uh, and she does refer to him as Mr. Clemens to her mother. I, you know, I... I don't know that I necessarily, in my head, have an answer to, to that in any specific way. She calls, when she's writing to Jane Clemens, which is Samuel's mother, she'll call him, your Sam, and put his name in quotation marks, your Samuel. So uh, again, clearly she, she, how people were named and how you used names mattered to her. Okay, I think it's back on. Um, let's see, there's a few here. Um, can you talk more about her failing health as the years went on and how it changed her outlook and relationships with her family? Sure. I mean, the early part of her life, it's a known, known documentary, right? That she took some sort of a fall and had to recover from that fall. Uh, maybe it was Pott's disease, maybe it was this neurasthasia that was somewhat common in young women in that time period. Uh, she spent two years in a care facility in New York City, and when she met Samuel Clemens, she was coming out of that period. And so some of those early letters, we do see her asking for her friend Lottie to help her pack her trunks, you know, 
clearly she's recovering from something, right? But then she's a new bride and she's taken off, you know, she's sailing the world and raising children. She suffers from pink eye every now and then. She's got typhoid fever because her friend died of typhoid fever and takes her a while to recover from that. Uh, she has diphtheria, you know, she, this is not the age of vaccinations, right? So she's going to pass through a normal amount of sickness, as does Samuel. You learn about the fact that he was not feeling well a lot of times, too, because she's concerned about his health, you know. By the end of her life, well, uh, unbelievably, those years when the family has plummeted into bankruptcy, right, huge debt. You would think that those are the years where she completely falls apart, you know, and is bedridden. And that's the, those are the years that she takes off on an around-the-world trip with her husband and is sleeping out on the decks of ships, looking up at the stars, writing about the flying fish, seeing meteors, uh, in 20-foot squalls, squ 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 what is that word? Waves. <laughs> I don't know, she doesn't seem like some weak, sickly woman to me, you know? I mean, but she does go to the baths in Europe, and so does Samuel, so do the daughters, you know? So they got sick and they went to the baths. They didn't go get a shot of amoxicillin, you know? So, and when um, Jean starts to present with um, epilepsy, they seek some electrical treatments in Europe from a man named Joseph Kelgren. So uh, I'm wandering in this answer, but I guess I'm trying to say that I think she started off kind of rocky and then passed through some normal illnesses. She was sick in pregnancies, but women are still sick in pregnancies today, you know. Uh, she, and, and eventually her heart failed her. So we see a really rough decline in the last two years of her life. Uh, I mean, there's, there's no heart treatment. So she declines mightily and quickly, but passes quietly in the end. Yes, any more here? Any more here? Yes, Al. That's correct. Yes, yeah, Susan Crane. The, the question was. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The um, uh, just clarifying whether uh, Mrs. Lang, Olivia Langdon, Sr., uh, inherited the quarry farm, the farm in Elmira, on on Jarvis Langdon's death. Yes, and she definitely did. Uh, yeah, Gretchen Charlo, or who sorry, was a, Susan Crane. Yeah, did I say that? She was a director at um, the Center for Mark Twain Studies previous to me. She actually found the deed, and so it's a well-documented fact. And it was a very forward-thinking gift to give property to a daughter. Yeah, the daughter being Susan Crane. I, I made a mistake and called her Olivia Langdon yeah, Sr. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. All right, I'll take it back. Um, the next one from our virtual audience is, if you could actually meet Olivia Clemens, for example, have dinner with her, what would you want to ask her or know about her? What a tricky question. I guess I would ask her if she read my book. <laughs> no, 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 that, that's completely mis misspoken. I'll ask her if she read her book and what she thought of it. Was she okay with it? If not, hope you'll forgive me. <laughs> she makes it pretty clear in some of her letters that she doesn't want them passed around. These letters are only for you, Sue, or uh, I can't stand the thought of them being passed around. So 
Yeah, yeah. When she says, Sue, dear, this is again to her sister, Susan Crane. Sue, dear, I cannot endure the idea of my letters traveling around. It is exceedingly distasteful to think of anyone else seeing them, so. Yeah, that's really painful there, to me. There you are. Very painful. I'm going to take the opportunity and ask Olivia Clemens, our tour guide, which I know the virtual audi audience can't see, but she's still here. <laughs> what would you ask her? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, I would, oh, gosh. I feel put up. Sorry. <laughs> um, I would ask, I would love to know uh, really what, were a few favorite moments to hear her say it, um, of her favorite moments with her family, I think, in the house, some magical moments, and to hear the details of that. That's a good answer. Good. There right. are some of those in the, in the letters where she talks about teaching the girls here. So, yeah. All right, the last one, I think, right now from the virtual audience, and again, I apologize for that crackling, um, is... Uh, uh, what surprises you most in Olivia's letters uh, and how it reveals her everyday relationships with Samuel Clemens and or one or two extraordinary moments? I know you already talked about the grief, but is there any other special moments? I guess um, maybe I said this a little bit earlier too, but just the moments of, of tenderness between them, some really beautiful expressions of intimate, intimate feelings, you know. Those were really sweet to read. Not long, lengthy paragraphs, but just, you know, she loves him, you know, and there's joy in that for her and for him, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Barbara. Thank really, you uh, so this much. Is wonderful. <laughs> it's an extraordinary book. Again, it. It kind of triangulates the family in a way that it has the family hasn't been portrayed before in this sort of three dimensions. We just hear from this guy who wants to take center stage by nature, uh, and this and is, she wants him to take center stage. I think too. She she loves that in him. Um, well, thank you again. Thank Barbara. you so much. Yeah, enjoyed this. Thanks.